G'day everyone. I'm Ebony Bennett. I'm the Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our webinar series. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work here in Canberra. It's Ngunnawal country here. Sovereignty was never ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And I'd like to pay my respect to elders past and present and welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us here today on the webinar. We only have two webinars left uh, this year, um, but make sure you go to our website at tai.org.au forward slash webinars so you don't miss out. On Thursday, we'll be talking to Nobel Prize economist uh, Joseph Stiglitz about regulating big tech. And then next week, we're talking to Laura Tingle about her new quarterly essay. Just a few tips before we begin to help things run smoothly today. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to see a Q&A function where you can ask questions of our panelists, upvote questions from other people, um, <clears throat> and also make comments on other people's uh, questions as well. Please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we will boot you out. We don't have to do it often, but we will do it if we need to. And lastly, a reminder that this discussion is being recorded and it will be posted up on the Australia Institute's website and YouTube page. We'll email it to anyone who missed out on the discussion. And also a reminder that it's being live streamed by WikiLeaks and Consortium News and welcome to you if that's how you're watching this today. Thank you very much for joining us today. We've had more than 1800 people RSVP, so a huge response. <clears throat> and it is so important to be talking about WikiLeaks and this book today, because for 14 years, WikiLeaks has published information provided by whistleblowers about how governments, companies, banks, militaries, the United Nations, political parties, you name it, uh, the media included, how they actually operate when they think that no one is looking. I can remember the first time I thought WikiLeaks was really hitting the mainstream consciousness, and that was with the release of the collateral murder video of US soldiers killing civilians in Iraq. And certainly the recent revelations of evidence that Australian special forces personnel committed alleged war crimes in Afghanistan, mm. um, well outside the heat of battle, remind us again of how important whistleblowers really are to a healthy functioning democracy. And the truth is that WikiLeaks has forged new paths for investigative journalism, as well as revealing uncomfortable truths to the public truths that many, many people would prefer to stay secret. In Australia, we've seen a concerning trend where public interest journalism and whistleblowers have been increasingly criminalised and the Australian government federally certainly seems far more concerned with prosecuting journalists and whistleblowers than prosecuting uh, the people who have committed the crimes, maladministration and corruption that they help to uncover. So too has Julian Assange been prosecuted for being a journalist and a publisher by the United States. And his prosecution represents a threat to journalism, freedom of the press and free speech. Yet the Australian government has done very little to assist this Australian citizen who has really helped change journalism forever. So I'm delighted to be talking about this book, A Secret Australia, revealed by the WikiLeaks exposés edited by Felicity Ruby and Peter Cronow and published by Monash University Publishing. The book, <coughs> excuse me, the book takes a closer look at what we can learn about Australia from the enormous WikiLeaks archive. The book is available from today. Peter, if you've got your copy there, you might want to hold it up for people to take a look at. It's available from all good bookstores and as an ebook, I'm going to pick up my copy from Paper Chain in Manica. And today I'm delighted to be speaking to co-editor Peter Cronow, who's an investigative journalist and producer for ABC TV's investigative documentary program, Four Corners, and has won numerous journalism awards, including the Gold Walkley on the political violence in East Timor in 2006. He's reported for ABC Radio's background briefing, and most recently with the groundbreaking report, Pine Gap's role in US war fighting. His forthcoming book is titled The Base, Australia's Secret Role in America's Global Wars. <clears throat> and I'm also delighted to introduce Jennifer Robinson, an Australian human rights lawyer and barrister in London, practicing in the areas of media law, public law, international law and extradition. She's been a member of the legal team acting for Julian Assange and WikiLeaks since 2010. She serves on the executive committee of the Commonwealth Law Association 
the advisory board of the European Centre for Constitutional and Human Rights and is a trustee of Article 19. She's also a founding board member of the Grata Fund, Australia's first independent public interest litigation fund, and she's conducted trial observation and human rights missions for the International Bar Association in Malaysia and Syria. Welcome, Jennifer. Welcome, Peter. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Hi. Peter, I'll start with you. Um, <clears throat> can you tell us why this book is important and why it was important to publish it now? Well, we all know there's a huge flood of information that hits us daily. Uh, it just churns out across you know, developments overseas with human rights, with all sorts of issues. And it's really hard to keep track of it. You know, Orwell, Orwell's um, memory hole is in perfect function. And the stories, the incidents that, um, that people don't want get thrown down that memory hole. Afghanistan's a great example. Four Corners was doing stories in the mid early 2000 and about six, I think, about uh, mistaken deaths of civilians um, at the hands of, um, of, of Australian, uh, uh, you know, uh, special forces. And, and all of these were investigated at the time and sort of churned along. But if, but if, if we can remember the things that happened in the past, then surely when, new issues come along, we realise there's a syst systemic issue here. It's not about a bad apple or three or 19. It's more about how a system uh, churns out young men for war and what it does to people, what it does to people when they get back from war. So, so journalism doesn't have much of a memory. And that's a shame because um, you, you can't sort of click the hot link and go to the historical record of what was uh, behind a story. So that's, we, we were just thinking, um, uh, Felicity and I met for the first time and in that first conversation we both thought that there was a huge gap for people to be reminded about the secrets that WikiLeaks had already told us all. I mean I'd forgotten half of them and I mean it's a it's a massive archive so what better way to do it than to ask a bunch of um, fellow Australian thinkers and writers and others to to pull together their thoughts on what WikiLeaks has done for us, the archive provides, the stories it provides, the sorts of information um, that's good to know about. So, um, so we did, and there's an enthusiastic bunch of people who wanted to do the book. We, it was initiated not through WikiLeaks itself, it's just an independent little grouping that decided to pop out uh, a, 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 a collection of works. And it, it doesn't reflect necessarily even the views of uh, Julian Assange. Uh, nonetheless, you know, and we all we all have um, uh, attitudes and opinions about him, but they shouldn't get in the way. I mean, they're probably all wrong anyway, but they shouldn't get in the way of his message. I mean, he doesn't want to talk about himself. He wants to talk about the information he's getting out there. So uh, I think the book, by reminding people of some of the things that, have, that we've learnt, um, of how um, Australia is manipulated in many ways, uh, with trade, with military issues, with all sorts of issues, and the way that we are expected to nod and go along. I think reminding us of all of that empowers us. It, it sets our minds open for countering the next thing that happens. So when we know that Afghanistan uh, government, the Taliban back in 2002 offered to hand over Bin Laden for trial in Europe, um, but it was knocked back by George Bush. We kind of think, well, hang on, when the next war comes along, will there be a way out that we haven't had told to us in great detail? So mm. I think it empowers people. It empowers people, knowledge empowers people to, to put the demands upon our government. If it's a democracy, it should be able to withstand some tough questioning. It should be able to, to withstand some investigative journalism. Apparently not, because there's been raids and threatened arrests and, and all the rest of it. So, um, but in, in the great traditions of uh, investigative journalism, of activism, there needs to be information provided to people for a democracy to work. So, mm, absolutely. so that, that's where that came from. And, um, you know, we, we hope the book uh, gets into lots of Christmas stockings. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly it makes for an interesting read. Uh, I'm about a third of the way through already. And um, yeah, there's certainly stuff in there that I had forgotten. Jennifer Robinson, you wrote the first chapter, but before we get into kind of what you uh, talked about uh, about West Papua there, 
as a part of Julian Assange's legal team, I just wondered to really start us off. A lot of people have questions about where that's up to and where that's headed. What is, um, where do things stand with Julian Assange's prosecution at the moment? Well, first, thank you for hosting, Ebony. Thanks to the Australia Institute and a huge thanks to Felicity and Peter for all of their hard work on putting this book together. Um, in terms of where Julian's case is at, we are, uh, we've now had all of the evidential hearings. Uh, we're in the final stages of the closing written submissions and a judgment is due on the 4th of January. Um, of course, just by way of brief summary, I'm sure most people know that know the brief facts, but he faces 175 years in prison for the very same publications which are written about in this book and for which he's been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, won the Walkley Award for Most Outstanding Contribution to Journalism and the Sydney Peace Prize. That's how stark this case is. He is currently in um, Belmarsh Prison, which is the highest security prison in this country, where he is on a ward where there's been a COVID outbreak. So he is effectively... Um, he's at severe risk of contracting COVID because of the respiratory um, issues that he's had as a result of being detained for uh, coming up on a decade now uh, in, in, in closed circumstances in the embassy and now in prison. Uh, he's not able to leave his cell because of the COVID restrictions, um, not even to wash. Um, and it's, it's a really serious situation. Um, we will have to see what happens after the 4th of January, but of course, um, there's lots of speculation now about what might happen as a result of the change of US administration. Um, but it, again, it remains to be seen. So it's a, it's a really serious situation and one where I, the conditions for him inside prison with the added um, impositions imposed by COVID mean that what, Belmarsh is an awful place at the best of times, but he has had very little social contact, uh, very, no, no meetings with us except in prison during the trial um, in the cells underneath the court. So uh, he's, it's been a very lonely experience for him this year. And Jennifer, just to go, we'll pick up, I think, probably and have some more questions uh, on that as we go. But to go mm -hmm. to the chapter that you've written for this book, um, it touches uh, on the situation in West Papua. And I think a lot of Australians will be familiar with uh, East Timor's quest for independence from Indonesia, but many people will probably be less familiar with West Papua's fight for independence, even though it's, uh, it's extremely close. What did WikiLeaks tell us about the intersection of military and corporate interests in West Papua? Well, first, I think just to, to give a little introduction about West Papua, today is the 1st of December, which is a really important day uh, for West Papuans. And I think uh, I'm sadly waiting for the news of what's going to happen over there today because there will be widespread protests. It's their national day. It's the day, 1st of December, 1961, when their national flag was raised, their uh, national anthem was first played, when they opened West Papuan Parliament uh, in front of Australian and British diplomats, when West Papua was due to become independent from the Dutch as a non-self-governing territory. And it was the next year that Indonesia invaded. Um, as a result of a, a UN brokered peace deal, or brokered by the US actually, a UN peace deal, there was a UN administration. Uh, it was the first ever UN administration of a territory long before East Timor ever was. Uh, and part of that deal required under the terms of the New York Agreement that they would get a vote on self-determination in 1969. That referendum, which was required to be universal suffrage uh, and a free and fair vote, uh, did, not, did not take place. They rounded up 1,022 uh, leaders and force them to vote for integration with Indonesia under threat of violence. Um, looking back at that time, uh, since then, of course, Australia has been complicit in Indonesia's unlawful occupation, just as we were with East Timor. Um, and since that time, there's been an ongoing conflict in West Papua and demands for uh, them to be able to exercise their right to self-determination under international law. Um, so today is a really important day for them. They've just announced a, a provisional government, which is a rejection, wholesale rejection of Indonesia's unlawful occupation, a demonstration of their desire to, to self-govern and an assertion of their right to self-determination. But what will likely happen is a, is a severe blowback in terms of Indonesian military and police response today in response to protests. So I'm anxiously awaiting news of, of what's going to be happening on the ground. Um, but in terms of what WikiLeaks showed us, what I tell in the chapter is really um, a, quite a personal story, actually, about what it meant for me as a much younger um, 
a much younger person when I was 21 I went to West Papua and what shocked me is as as you introduced is that so I didn't know anything about it and it's because journalists were not allowed to go there uh, there's very little written about it academically um, I really learned what I knew about West Papua from being on the ground so I was watching these things happen and learning about these things that were happening seeing diplomats come and learn about them but not seeing anything in the international media and so what we learned through the WikiLeaks material is what I knew was happening because I was on the ground, which is about the role of the Indonesian military in maintaining that occupation and facilitating the role of global corporates like Freeport Gold Mine, the biggest uh, gold and copper mine in the world. But importantly, the way in which the mine was paying the military in corrupt ways, um, not through official bank accounts to, to direct individuals for security around the mine, which created an incentive structure whereby the Indonesian military would create security incidents around the mine, including killing Americans and we think an Australian, um, in order to justify their military budget. We also learned that the Indonesian military, because they don't have sufficient budget to run their operations, were running illegal logging op operations, um, unlawful drug trade, uh, and of course the extent to which the Indonesian military is conducting um, operations resulting in mass human rights abuse, torture, rape, extrajudicial killings of Indigenous West Papuans. And of course, what was really important, I think, after East Timor, and, and many people will remember this, is that because of the role of the Indonesian Special Forces um, uh, in war crimes in East Timor, the US and Australia cut off military ties and support for the Indonesian military um, because of their human rights record. What we learned from WikiLeaks disclosures is that the US knew exactly what was happening in West Papua and uh, restarted their military ties, despite what they knew about what was happening on the ground. And these are really important things. So for me, when WikiLeaks came along, because I had this history in West Papua and I'd seen what was happening, I'd had meetings with diplomats where they were basically telling us to shut up about what was actually happening on the ground. Uh, I, I really felt the importance of what, when I observed WikiLeaks before I even became Julian's lawyer, I already understood the significance of what this could mean for places like West Papua. And then of course, with Cablegate, we saw precisely what it would mean through the disclosures that came out. So I think because of that very personal experience, when I was watching WikiLeaks, I thought this is important. This is going to change things. And when we have documents that tell us this is happening, um, it can make so much of a difference for people on the ground, for us as human rights lawyers, our ability to hold, hold governments to account. And the fact, I think I say this um, in the book, that even if you know it's happening, so for me, I knew this was happening. It didn't tell me anything I didn't know. But having documents to show it, that the United States government is reporting back to its own government for the purposes of policymaking to say this is happening, makes it much harder for anyone to deny that it's happening. And that is really, really important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that, I guess, brings me back to <clears throat> the role of WikiLeaks in investigative journalism and uncovering these types of, you know, whether it's the cables or uh, other documents or uh, caches from, from whistleblowers. Peter, I'll come back to you. Tell us a little bit about what's in the book about the role of WikiLeaks in facilitating that type of investigative journalism and really providing a new secure conduit for the dropping of documents or for whistleblowers to come forward in a secure way to release this type of information that would otherwise never see the light of day. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Ebony, it, it, it is unique in that it's created a, um, it sees journalism as a permanent archive and not as uh, just passing news. It's, it sees it as an, a permanent archive of original documents. Um, with explanations covering what they're about so that people can look back and, and read them for themselves. It's not just a matter of trying to remember what was in the news last week, if it's a major story that, that WikiLeaks has documents on, but it's also allowed um, uh, global collaboration as never before. Um, as you know, the Afghan war logs were uh, spectacularly shared amongst numerous papers in Germany and Britain and, and the United States. And, and that sort of global collaboration has a, a lot more power to it than individuals working individually in silos in their own countries. It, um, it allows people to see the systems at work. It allows people to see the common uh, players at work. And, and that helps journalism immensely because the danger is it slips down the memory hole. Now, um, 
uh, there's also been some spectacular initiatives as well. Uh, one of them is the, the use of anonymous drop boxes. Now, anonymous drop boxes are sort of used for most media now. Most media out outlets have them. Um, uh, and an anonymous drop box allows somebody to submit a, a document or some information anonymously. Now, nothing is 100% safe in terms of anonymity. However, the secure Dropbox system allows people to, you know, to send in information, tip-offs, documents, whatever they want to put through without the fear of being hunted down by, uh, by any authorities. The difficulty is these days is with digital communications, there's fingerprints left of every phone call, of every uh, Google search, of every time you catch a taxi to go and meet a, a, a source. Uh, there's digital footprints uh, left behind and it's so important for people to be able to step around that and it, it's an amazing uh, it's kind of an assumed part of all major media outlets now but it's a it's a terrific WikiLeaks initiative uh, even the ABC has has a Dropbox now has had one for about 18 months or so and um, uh, without these new techniques we will be steamrolled by the surveillance state. It's, it is so powerful, as we've learned from the, the disclosures of, of Snowden, that um, unless we take steps, we're, we're going to lose uh, the ability for people to come forward if they've got concerns about issues happening that don't have a, a proper response through proper channels, such as uh, the Afghanistan uh, revelations that came uh, uh, initially, I think, through through uh, David McBride. Um, and he's now in court, obviously, fighting for his freedom to try to stay out of jail for telling us what we all know and has now been reported by the Inspector General of the ADF and has, uh, you know, been released to the public. And nonetheless, he's been left behind uh, and is, fa and is fight fighting that fight. Now that journalists were also targeted um, over reporting of of um, Afghanistan. Clearly, Julian's uh, one of the largest things he's uh, put information out about and, and written about himself has been Afghanistan. Um, in other countries, Afghanistan has also been very sensitive with people such as Nikki Hager in New Zealand copying uh, a very close look by his intelligence agencies. In Australia, mm -hmm. we know journalists are being raided, are being uh, surveilled, their workplaces are being raided. And we had the spectacular moment where what's happening with Julian almost happened here, where a journalist was targeted for charges by the Attorney General of Australia. The, the attorney referred to the, to the Commonwealth DPP, an, uh, an ABC journalist, Dan Oakes, for uh, consideration of charges being laid against him. Now, that's a very big step. Uh, uh, I believe confidence has been taken by the treatment, the people here seeing the treatment of Julian Assange. If, it's, if, if the Western world is able to start nailing journalists for doing their jobs overseas, well, it looks like Canberra is going to have a go as well. So fortunately with, uh, with the ABC journalist, the public interest uh, uh, aspect of pursuing his case saw it dropped. It was not in the public interest to pursue it. And likewise, the potential whistleblower for the um, uh, uh, and Annika Smethurst's files that, that she published about DSD, ASD, wanting to be able to surveil Australians. Th these have been dropped through public interest and, and that it is not in the public interest to close down journalism. Now, these are very important steps to take. With, with Julian, I mean, we've got miles to go to convince people as to why he is, needs to be treated the same. Clearly, his work is in the public interest. You can read it in the book. I mean, there's numerous examples of information that's been released that has spectacularly informed the public. I mean, one of my favourites that I've um, that's in, that's included in the introduction of the book, as just a small taster, is the um, the leaking by WikiLeaks of an information uh, operations manual from the Australian Defence Force. And that information operations manual, it's been, it was leaked, it has been on the WikiLeaks website for ages, but no one picked it up. There's been no mainstream reporting that I've been able to find. But what it sets out is how the uh, public relations 
uh, public affairs section of the Australian Defence Force uh, acts and it you know quote unquote to avoid restraints on its actions in conflicts overseas. Those constraints would be things like parliament and public opinion and journalism. So therefore, um, they, they, a lot of money gets spent um, for defence public affairs. We have a lot of mm. uh, launches of new equipment, of ships and displays of planes, and we have embedded journalists. We have you know marching bands and uh, and whatever. But but we have to know that that money and effort is also being put into ensuring the Australian public doesn't take a, a, a negative view of what the military does. And, and spectacularly, that document also says that it's uh, that the reason they wanted to do that is to impress the international community that Australia can still make a contribution. Well, I think by international uh, community, it means the United States, of course. And, and therefore, think about it. We have a public affairs uh, section of the Defence Force funded by Australian taxpayers meant to put a smiling face on what, what the work of um, the Defence Force does, to keep eyes away, to keep journalists distracted. Um, we now can read this. It's been released by WikiLeaks. It's there. People can Google it after this um, session tonight and have a read. It's, it's, um, that's the sort of information we should be aware of. Clearly, the Defence Forces do a, an enormously good amount of work defending the country and looking after our interests. But when there's downsides, we don't want them to be papered over. We want the War Memorial to have a, a section on war crimes. We don't want uh, Hollywood to be in, in the War Memorial. But, um, but, you know, the brief for public affairs, information's operation on the Australian public is a, a shocking uh, concept. And, um, and I, I think people wouldn't know about it. Wouldn't know the black and white of it. Would suspect, no. it, but wouldn't know the black and white of it by a document. You can print it out and put staples through it and keep it as a as a an example of of how this happens, how how the propaganda is run across the Australian public, how narratives are being set, and it helps you understand the sort of reporting that then results. Because um, you know, public affairs. Uh, people work hard on convincing journalists on how to report stories. They sure do. Um, I was struck by, I think it was Sulette Dreyfus's chapter where she talked about the price that Julian and WikiLeaks had paid for being the early adopters, or not the early adopters, the people who invented the concept of, you know, the anonymous Dropbox and, and many other um, <clears throat> new methods of journalism that they've pioneered. Um, but I was also struck by obviously the, the huge price that comes with being the first to do something and the backlash that comes from that. Jennifer, coming back to you, I was always struck by the fact that the Obama administration um, obviously looked very carefully at prosecuting Assange, um, but it seemed to me that, that they couldn't find a way to do it that wasn't also going to end up with perhaps prosecuting the New York Times or any of the other mainstream um, media organisations that have collaborated with WikiLeaks over the years. What for you are some of the implications for freedom of speech and freedom of the press uh, raised by WikiLeaks and the backlash and the prosecution of Julian as a publisher? And I guess if you could reflect on, you know, the United States has the First Amendment to protect freedom of speech, but Australia, we have we have nothing like that. How important is WikiLeaks in that context for protecting freedom of speech and, and freedom of the press? They are all big questions you've just asked, Ebony, so I'll try and answer them quickly. Um, well, first about the, the free speech implications of, of the prosecution of Assange. And so we know now that the Obama administration took a decision not to prosecute. There was no indictment um, by the end of the Obama administration. And that was consistent with the public statements that were being made at the time by Eric Holder, the then Attorney General, that they, you know no journalist would go to jail on his watch. Um, and this was precisely because of what you described about what we call the New York Times problem, which is as the New York Times general counsel himself has said, there's that the law will have a very difficult time in distinguishing between what WikiLeaks and what the New York Times does. And that's because um, if you look at the indictment uh, against Julian Assange, it includes passive receipt, it re includes receipt, possession, and publication of classified information. Now, 
the prosecutors are doing their very best to try to distinguish between what WikiLeaks does and what journalists do all the time um, and sad, well, unsuccessfully, because the, the danger of this prosecution is, is that it will apply to the rest of the media. Um, when you think about um, because of this, if it means that any journalist anywhere in the world could face prosecution in the United States for publishing truthful information about the United States. That's the fact of this. Um, what, this what we're seeing with the prosecution strategy is a, an attempt to criminalize what journalists do all the time in terms of their communications with a source. So if you talk to a source, if you ask a source for a particular piece of information, you ask them for more information, which is what journalists do all the time. What the US case against Julian is saying is, well, that is conspiracy with the source to steal information. That is going to criminalize all national security journalism. Um, that is why it is so dangerous. In fact, some of our expert evidence before the evidential hearing in September um, the prosecution is trying to run this case. Well, this is not about publication. It's only publishing people who, uh, publishing the names of people who will be put at harm. But that's an editorial judgment. Newspapers all day, every day are assessing whether to publish information, either uh, national security information, which the US government or any government says could potentially damage either national security or cause risk to individuals. The Snowden revelations, for example, you know, the government the government was screaming about the damage that The Guardian was going to do, and The Guardian made a decision to publish that information. Uh, it is an editorial judgment and one that newspapers make all day, every day, in every country around the world. Um, so it is, it is significant, and I think Peter's right to say that the precedent that we're seeing set with this case, uh, Julian is, of course, being published, uh, prosecuted in relation to the publication of the Afghan war logs, uh, of the Iraq war logs and Cablegate. And so when we saw the raids take place in Australia, we've been saying for years and years that this, if this, this criminal investigation into WikiLeaks is dangerous for journalism, it's going to chill national security journalism. And you, because you can't distinguish between what WikiLeaks does and the rest of the media does, uh, it's, it's going to apply to the rest of the media. And we're seeing it happen already. We've seen it happen in Australia. We've seen it happen in the prosecution theory used by Bolsonaro to try to prosecute Glenn Greenwald. Um, this is a very dangerous trend and one that, you know, I think journalists the world over are very worried about. Um, I think that answers your question, Ebony. I'm sorry. Did I miss something? Yeah, no, I just, um, just to pick up on the difference between <clears throat> America where you've got the, the, the First Amendment and somewhere like Australia where there really is no kind of guaranteed uh, protection for freedom of speech, I guess the, the risk is, is all the greater for these styles of, of prosecutions. Well, the first thing to note about the First Amendment is that the US government is arguing in our case that because Julian is Australian, he won't benefit from First Amendment protections. Now, think about that as a precedent. So what the US government is effectively saying for all journalists outside of the country who are not nationals is if you publish truthful information, if you receive, possess or publish uh, classified information of the United States, we will exercise our jurisdiction outside of our borders to seek to extradite you to bring you back to the US for prosecution where you will not have constitutional free speech protections. That is what they're running in the Assange case. And that's why it's, uh, again, even more dangerous than we first thought. Um, but with respect to Australia, we are in a very diff different position because we don't have a Bill of Rights. We don't have a right to free speech. The implied right to political communication such as it is, is not sufficient. If you look at our disclosure laws in Australia and there's an ongoing inquiry at the moment, um, I made a submission together with the Association for International Broadcasters. Australia's disclosure laws are terrifying. And some of, I mean, compared to the Official Secrets Act in, in the UK, the potential sentences under Australia's laws are far outweigh anything you see in the United Kingdom. 25 years are up to life in prison for breaching Australia's disclosure laws, no public interest defence, no exclusion for journalists. It is, it's actually quite terrifying when you get to grips with the extent of our national security laws. Um, now, of course, the right decision was ultimately taken with respect to Dan Oakes and the others who are under investigation in Australia, but they should never have been investigated in the first place. Um, and that, that what those journalists were put through by our government is it signals 
to all journalists in Australia what they're at risk of. And they shouldn't, there should be no risk of that kind of nature for journalists engaging in that kind of public interest journalism. And it's great that the ABC stood by them. And it's great that that prosecution was dropped. But what was interesting as an Australian observing this from abroad is how, how outraged Australian journalists were about this case, but yet we don't see the, the same, enough of the same outrage, I don't think, from mainstream journalists in, in Australia about Julian. And that's not to say that it's not, you know, we have free speech groups around the world, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, human rights groups, free speech groups, the International Federation of Journalists, um, united in their opposition to this prosecution of, of Assange. Um, and I really think it's time that there is more, that more pressure is put on the Australian government, not just about Julian's case, but because of what that means for journalism more broadly, and about our disclosure laws in Australia through the through Parliament that we ought to be pushing for reforms around ensuring that there is a public interest defence because we sh we sh ought to have a right to know, and we should know what our governments are doing in our name. Absolutely. Um, so I can see that we've got about 780 people uh, who've tuned in. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll go now to questions from uh, the audience. Um, <clears throat> so the first one is from Fred Sin. And he asks, what can we, Australia and every nation, um, do to protect whistleblowers in an age where organisations, corporations, government bodies are hiding behind disclosure clauses to protect themselves from disrepute. I might come to you first, Jennifer, and then you, Peter. It's a, it's a really good question. Um, so I think using WikiLeaks technology is one excellent way of starting. So, I mean, as, as we discussed earlier, and as Sulette explains in, in her chapter in this book, um, the anonymous Dropbox model that WikiLeaks created is that's precisely why it's so important. Um, because it provides a secure tool by which sources can come forward and submit material anonymously to protect their identity. Now, why is that so important? And why has it been considered so revolutionary to the extent that now it's um, been adopted by media organizations and government agencies around the world? Um, that's because as journalists well know, the whistleblowing protection and protection for sources is very limited. Uh, now, after I've been talking about how limited the protection is for journalists as well, but we, in general, we do recognise that journalists, well, historically, we have recognised that journalists are able to receive information without facing prosecution themselves and are able to publish that information. Together with that, they have an obligation to protect their source. Now, why do they have an obligation to protect their source? Because we recognize that if sources are going to face prosecution for having released information, there will be a chill on, on public interest leaks, and that is a legitimate interest in a democratic society, protected where I live by the European Convention under Article 10, uh, in Australia, not so much. Um, and so I think it's this protection of the identity of whistleblowers to protect them from prosecution, which is so important, which is why the technology that WikiLeaks provides, I used to say in talks about it, is provides a level of protection that the law doesn't. And that's why it was so revolutionary, because a journalist could be forced to reveal the name of their sources in court by court order or face contempt proceedings. But if you don't know who your source is because they've submitted it or, um, anonymously, but you can verify the document, then it's still reportable. Um, but that, that protects whistleblowers. So um, I think that's why WikiLeaks has been and the technology that they've created and introduced to journalism is so important. Mm. Um, Peter, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, only that, uh, that the whistleblowers are the ones who's, who are putting themselves on the line. And um, if they lose confidence in the media's ability to protect their identity because of the digital tracking of their communications, then um, they'll, they'll disappear. Um, I mean, the very day after the ABC raids for a, for a program at the ABC, uh, a person who was not quite a whistleblower, but maybe a, um, a person who didn't want to go public on a very important matter pulled out of an interview. The story dropped, it died the day after the ABC raids. Now that's the chilling effect that that, that sort of action by the Australian government uh, has, which is intended, totally intended, to scare off uh, potential uh, whistleblowers. So I think we need to be sure that we've got safe, uh, 
things like drop boxes, that we have other safe communication tools that are, that are made known on the media, media organisations' websites, but also that when, uh, when a whistleblower is being hammered for releasing information in the public interest, the media generally doesn't forget them. It, it does pursue their cases and, and put, put them in the public eye. So that's a really important thing. What can individual people out there do? Lots, lots. They can talk, they can use their voice, they can organise, they can take actions, they can ring, they can phone, they can write letters to the editor. They can. There's a whole bunch of the traditional lobbying tools that people can do. They can ring their local member and say, are you a supporter of, of whistleblowers being thrown into prison? I mean, ask them the questions. Are you in favour of transparency? Well, why aren't you helping whistleblowers? You know, why is the, the hero of the Afghan leaks in Australia facing jail? I mean, just Peter, ask, ask a politician that. What are they going to say? Yeah, Peter, I did just want to come back and, you know, you've obviously been in the ABC for many years and, you know, without asking you to dump on your colleagues, I certainly have been, uh, like Jennifer said, a, a little bit shocked by some of the reaction from the Australian media um, to Julian's case. And there seemed to be, you know, a little while back, a great deal of uh, discussion about whether or not he even was a journalist without necessarily considering the implications of whether or not you think he is, if he gets prosecuted for this, you know, what does that say about journalism and, and put journalism under threat? Um, how do you think the Australian media overall has reacted and, and do they need to be doing more, particularly in light of the raids on the ABC, um, you know, the prosecution of whistleblowers that we're seeing? It's all in, you know, quite a, um, a, a boiler of, a, of an atmosphere at the moment. Look, look, I think the raids on the ABC, terrible though they were in, in terms of what it says for our democracy, really opened the eyes of a lot of journalists as to what's going on and showed that the sort of treatment of Julian Assange is, is happening here. And, uh, and I think a lot of journalists at that point realised that what Julian Assange and, and his supporters had been saying for so long was true. And they were seeing it happen we actually got out there and watched the federal police in our building at the ABC and, um, and John Lyons live tweeted uh, the raid and the downloading of, uh, of files. It, it was a huge moment for, for ABC journalists to see this happening to ourselves and for the first time journalists, News Limited, ABC and others united in, in, in a call for, for proper protections for journalism. So, so why do, why do journalists not care about, uh, about um, Julian? Why do they say he's not a journalist? That's because they're pretty, pretty uninformed and all, or just plain stupid, really. I think, I think they need to realise that um, someone who's won more journalism awards, who writes articles, who publishes original documents, that's a pretty good definition of a journalist, in my view. And, um, but, but that narrative is not an unintentional one. It's helped to put Julian in jeopardy by being not a journalist and not being able to get protection of uh, the, the amendment in, in, in the United States, with, with United States laws. And I, I think that, that that's a narrative that was put out and pushed around by some people that to their shame, uh, they, shouldn't, they should have thought about that because by calling someone not a journalist, they're stripping them of any basic protections they might have had. And now that they're coming for us in Australia, now that the authorities are quite happy to raid and potentially arrest and charge, we'd better realise that, you know, it's that old saying of, you know, they came for the teachers, they came for the unionists, and now they're coming for the journalists. So I, I think people have really learned a lot by seeing those raids. I think it's had a huge uh, shock effect on journalists and a lot more people are speaking out in favour of Assange. And I've got to say the number of people at the ABC who said, good on you for doing the book, you know, they, they may not be prepared to shout from the rooftops because, you know, Julian sometimes can be controversial. Uh, uh, but, but, you know, they, they're very, very happy to see the support for him. And, um, uh, yeah, I, I think there's been a tired change. And uh, I think that, that journalists now realise they're in jeopardy. And if we don't do something about it, the, the freedoms we have are just going to keep on slipping away. Uh, law change by law change. You know, we've had more than 70 laws, you know, 
produced in the in the the, the war on terrorism uh, phase of this century, uh, something like 70 odd laws that have affected the right to free speech, that have limited journalists in what they can do. Um, and, and a lot of it happens in secret. Like as a journalist, I can have a warrant taken out on me. They can't look at my phone records or, or metadata legally without a warrant. Well, warrants are just warrants and can be, can be prepared. Not many are prepared only about a dozen a year on journalists, but that's a dozen a year. Journalists wow. whose contacts and phone calls and movements and attitudes have been monitored in great depth, or maybe not great depth, we don't know. The journalists are not told uh, if there's a warrant out on them. Um, it, it's, a, it's a huge uh, intrusion into, into journalists' uh, ability to tell the public what's going on. And really that's all journalism is to tell the public what's going on, because without that, we're just blind and we'll just believe the next narrative, the next focus group statement from a, from a leader. And, um, you know, the power's in the public's hands and with information, they can use it. Um, Jennifer, coming back to you, I've got a quick question here, or maybe it won't be quick, uh, from Kate Dennehy. Is the Australian government doing anything to get Julian Assange freed? If not, why not? An excellent question. If they are, we don't know about it. <laughs> it certainly seems not. Um, look, this has been something for me that has been so deeply disappointing, um, which is the Australian government's failure to stick up for this Australian citizen. We have been doing outreach to the Australian government since 2010. I feel like a broken record in the sense that I've been talking since 2010 about the implications that any indictment would have for the rest of the media, um, that this would affect the media around the world, that othering WikiLeaks or somehow putting them in some other category is not going to protect them, um, and that the Australian government ought to be doing more to protect this Australian citizen. And sadly, 10 years on, successive governments, Labor and Liberal, we haven't seen sufficient action. Um, but it's never too late. <laughs> Um, the Australian government can and should be exercising diplomatic protection over Assange. This case is so outrageous. Um, we've seen what the Australian government can do. That I mean, Maurice Payne just negotiated the return for Kylie Moore Gilbert, which is wonderful, wonderful news. She was facing espionage charges in Iran, completely baseless, obviously. Um, but we have another Australian citizen in a high security prison in the UK facing espionage charges, a journalist, a celebrated Australian journalist who's won all these journalism awards the world over, been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for successive years, and the Australian government is doing nothing to bring him home. Now, that's a pretty dire reflection of, of our government and a pretty dire reflection of what our special relationship with the United States means. Mm. And I think that's probably one of the... Um, Julian's case itself is revealing of the nature of Australia's relationship with the United States, but that's one of the key themes that comes through in this book over and over, also about what we learnt as a result of the WikiLeaks revelations. So I really do encourage, I don't think, this case is so political. Um, if the Australian government took a more proactive stance, I don't think we would be where we are now. Mm. And if the Australian government took a proactive stance, I think that they have, would have an excellent shot at negotiating his release, either at the end of the Trump administration or at the beginning of Biden's. And I think Australians ought to be calling their local MP, ought to be raising it with their local MP, to be raising it with the foreign minister, to put more pressure on our government to do the right thing. Um, the next question is for you as well, Jennifer. It's from Joshua Clark. Um, is it appropriate for whistleblowers such as David McBride, who may have breached Australia's national security laws in their disclosures, to need to rely on the Commonwealth DPP or the Attorney General to exercise their discretion not to prosecute because of public interest? Or is reform needed? And, and what would that reform look like? Reform is absolutely needed. I mean, Yes, the DPP, that discretion was exercised in the right way, finally, but years too late in respect to the ABC journalists who were looking at being prosecuted. But obviously it didn't work for the, for the source himself. Um, and of course, we ought to have a statutory protection, a public interest defence, both for journalists and for whistleblowers, because we, we have to now acknowledge, look what's come out about 
look at the the outrage about Australian war crimes. Um, we wouldn't have known this if it weren't for brave whistleblowers. And so uh, it is an essential part of democracy. I really recommend that people, um, if you read the jurisprudence coming out of the European Court of Human Rights around why it's so important that we protect public interest disclosures, if whistleblowers are going to face prosecution like this, it deters the next one. And so what won't we know about the next Australian war crime? And so it, absolutely there needs to be some sort of reform to protect principled leaking. Speaking of principled leaking, I really thought Paul Barrett's um, chapter on, you know, that there is a role for secrecy in government, but equally whistleblowers are, are actually an important kind of safety valve as well. Um, Peter, I'll come back to you. What are some of the other really interesting concepts teased out in the book that you think people might find surprising or unexpected or an insight that they maybe hadn't thought about or... Um, well, well, that one you just mentioned is, a, is, is an excellent point, and that is what is a secret and what is highly classified, what can't be told to the public. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of documents, Paul Barrett has um, written about this and others have spoken about it, that, that are classified as routine and, and really don't hold any secrets that could be putting Australia at danger if they were released. However... They're a way of avoiding embarrassment. They're a way of providing transparency into the favours being done by government uh, to outside organisations. It, it would just reveal uh, how the power is working. So, so most of those uh, classifier documents don't actually give away national secrets. I mean, like the Bernard Colliery case, uh, you've got an example there where you know, what, what are they going to leak? How the, how the bugging was done in Timor? Well, that was 18 years ago. I mean, I, I think they would have improved the technique since then. It's more about embarrassment. And so many uh, documents uh, are slammed away in the archive as being uh, classified than really needs to be. And that's, that's why journalists have now got their own archive of leaked material. Um, there's a few organisations around the world that do this, but WikiLeaks has got the biggest one. And um, that, that's a sensational uh, change in that uh, uh, we, can, we can find out things such as the work of the US Embassy in Canberra. I mean, some of the things they've been up to, people have speculated about for years with the, with the overthrow 50 years ago of the Whitlam government. People suspected what might have happened. But now we have documents that state what the US Embassy staff have been doing with members of the Labor Party, with members of industry and the Liberal Party as well. But they've been talking to protected sources within the Labor Party, developing profiles of who can be the next leader to step in if, that, if the current leader was to be shoved out of the way. I mean, there's some spectacular uh, pieces of information that remove allegations of conspiracy because they're the documents. And, and that's why leaking of documents and preserving of them and the style of journalism of keeping the documents available forever is such a revolution. You're not relying on a journalist cherry picking two points out of a trove of documents. You're allowing them to sit there and be read by everybody. And people after this can type in the word protected and Labor Party into their search engine and they'll read all about what the US Embassy has been up in gathering information about how leadership, about how factions work within the Labor Party. And the obvious question, I think Clinton Fernandez in his chapter asked this, the obvious question is, why do they need to know that? So, yeah, look, the, the releases by WikiLeaks have... Uh, have just peeled back uh, so much of the covering up of various aspects of Australian society that, you know, work your way slowly through the book and think about it as you go because, uh, and, and spend some time on the website, I'd recommend it. It's fun. Put in people's names, put in, put in your favourite politician's name and see what pops up because um, it's a permanent archive. The National Archive of Australia is wonderful. But it's filtered. It's, well, it's censored. We saw that with the palace papers and the palace letters. And WikiLeaks is not. 
you know, I, I think it's um, it's it's such a challenge to to archivists around the world. It's a challenge to governments. It's a challenge to people in media who want to be the the controllers of the narrative, you know, such as people in the Murdoch papers. Mm. I think that it's very important that um, that people see through some of the things being said, and you can do it by just searching in the WikiLeaks archive. And it's so important that it continue. And um, Australia's benefited a lot. Yeah, um, just picking up on something Peter mentioned there with uh, Bernard Caleri and uh, his prosecution. Jennifer, I think that really shocked the legal fraternity. We've been talking a lot about journalists being prosecuted for doing their jobs, but there we've got a lawyer being prosecuted for doing his job. But you're really, as part of um, Assange's legal team, been at the, the very hard edge of some of the consequences um, for publishing that kind of material. Can you reflect over those last couple of years on like what has shocked you about this case as, as you've um, followed it and, and been part of it? Where to begin? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, go back to 2010 when this all first started. I remember when I first started representing Julian, um, he said to me, before he published Cablegate, you know, they, they will chase me to the end of the earth and make my life hell. Uh, but I have an obligation to release this information to the source and to the public because it's so important about what it reveals about the way the US operates in the world for every single country in the world. And I didn't understand the significance of what he just said or what was about to happen, but he did. What happened? His bank accounts were frozen. WikiLeaks was kicked off all kinds of servers, uh, find all the credit cards, um, basically on the say-so on the on influence of US politicians, um, cut WikiLeaks off from all financial donations, so Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, an Interpol red notice, um, years stoushing through um, a, a criminal case that in the end uh, didn't go anywhere but where he wasn't afforded proper due process. The Australian government threatened to cancel his passport. There was an international manhunt for him. Um, <clears throat> seeking asylum inside the embassy, us being spied on unlawfully, me being threatened by the US government. Um, uh, the biggest criminal investigation in US history. Um, you know, I mean, now an unprecedented espionage prosecution. Uh, we now know there was unlawful spying inside the embassy to the extent that they tried to take his baby's nappy to get the DNA of his child. I mean, the us as lawyers were specifically targeted um, for, for surveillance and in, in one case, physical surveillance. Um, it's it's shocking. It is shocking that this kind of thing can happen to this kind of, I, would, I call it persecution, that this kind of persecution can happen in democratic countries against an Australian citizen, against his lawyers. It, what does that say about our ability to properly defend our client when we're being targeted in that way? Um, you know, there was a lawyer's rights watch complaint about the way I've been treated as an Australian lawyer practicing in England. That's the kind of thing that we would not expect um, from the US, from the UK. Um, you know, the US prosecution is arguing in our case that all the methods they used against us, spying, uh, spying on legally privileged communications, that that's all fine. What does that say about this? I mean, Daniel Ellsberg gave uh, one of the most, I think, striking moments of the trial uh, in the UK, the evidential hearing was uh, Daniel Ellsberg being cross-examined by the prosecutors about his role as the Pentagon Papers leaker. And he explained that the kind of abuse against him by the Nixon administration, which resulted in his case being thrown out with prejudice, has happened and on a mass scale towards Julian Assange. So what does it say about democracy if what would have had a case thrown out with prejudice in the 70s, um, now when far worse is happening towards him, the prosecution goes ahead. I think we need to ask ourselves what democracy means and what, where, what human rights mean in that context. Mm. Well, I'm afraid we're gonna to have to wrap it up there. I really wanna thank everyone for coming along today and thanks for your excellent questions. As always, I'm really sorry that we couldn't get to all of them, um, but we really appreciate you tuning in. Um, thank you to Peter and Jennifer. We really appreciate your time, particularly you, Jennifer, getting up at the crack of dawn, I think it is over there in London, uh, nice and early for you. Uh, we do really appreciate that uh, as well. 
Um, and I want to also thank WikiLeaks who've uh, live streamed this and Consortium News. We appreciate that as well. And I want to thank all the other contributors to the book, A Secret Australia from Monash University Publishing, available at all good bookshops and online. You can get it as an ebook as well. Check it out. It's a really gripping read. There'll be things in there that you've forgotten, things that you didn't even know had been revealed. The contributors include Scott Ludlam, former Defence Secretary Paul Barrett, Lawyers Julian Assange, um, academics Richard Tanter, Benedetta Bravini, John Keane, Sulet Drapus, Jared Goggin and Clinton Fernandez, psychologist Lisa Johnson, as well as writers and journalists Andrew Fowler, Quentin Dempster, Anthony Lowenstein, Guy Rundle, George Giddos, Helen Razor and Julian Assange. It's a great book. Make sure you check it out. Uh, we've got another exciting webinar this Thursday at 11 a.m. with Nobel Laureate Economist Professor Joseph Stiglitz and Anya Schifrin from Columbia University. That'll be on regulating big tech and Australia's news media code. And next Wednesday at 10 a.m., we'll be talking to Laura Tingle about her new quarterly essay. She's the Chief Political Correspondent of ABC's 7.30 program about what Australia can learn from New Zealand. So that'll be a great one. So check that out. Also make sure you're subscribed to our podcast, Follow the Money, where we explain big economic issues in plain English. You can find that on iTunes or wherever you normally listen to your podcasts. And remember, stay safe out there, everyone. Stay one and a half metres away. Keep washing those hands. Wear a mask if you can. And we'll hopefully see you in a couple of days. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks so much, Ebony, and to the Institute. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.